A very good morning to everyone. My name is Harish and I'm your host for today. Welcome to Unleash the Power of Data with AI in the Age of Internet of Behavior webinar. I would like to introduce today's speakers, Mr. David Chan, Managing Director, Mr. Dayan Dukarik, Executive Director of Engineering at, Adno at Novum Singapore. They'll be sharing how organizations in today's digital age should unleash the power of data with AI in the age of Internet of Behavior. All attendees today are entitled to a complimentary data maturity assessment by Adnova. Do also look out and participate in the three poll questions in between the session in order to be one of the lucky 100 winners who will be given a $10 grab food voucher. This morning, we are pleased to have Mr. Dutch Ng, Chairman of SG Tech's Cybersecurity Chapter, to deliver the welcome address. Without further ado, I would like to begin the webinar by inviting Mr. Dutch Ng to deliver the welcome address. Mr. Ng, please. Thank you, Harish. Uh, let me pull out a slide. Hi, good morning. I'm Dutch, the chairman of SG Tech Cybersecurity Chapter. Uh, it's great to see you all again, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on Alash, the power of data with AI in the age of internet of behavior. In today's session, you will gain valuable insight from our speakers from Adnovum Technology. They will share with you on how they effectively leverage data by utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning in the age of internet of behavior. We also learn how to access and mitigate different types of risks impacting ML development. So to our old friends and assisting member of SG Tech, it's nice to have you with us again. To our new friends, unfamiliar with what SG Tech does, let me give you a brief introduction. EduTech is a premium trade association set up to represent and champion the interests of the tech industry in Singapore. Within the rapid evolving technology landscape, EduTech strives to create an ecosystem that anticipates trends and develop sustainable initiatives to strengthen and grow the industry. Currently, we have more than 900 members ranging from innovative startups, vibrant small and medium-sized enterprises, to top MNCs, whom we are representing and articulating any technology industry concerns to relevant authority and stakeholders. Agitech strives to create an ecosystem that to strengthen the community and help the industry or ICT industry to grow. Agitech serves as active voice for the tech industry for actively and responsibly advocating the for change while remaining a trusted and respected partner of the government. Agitech contributes to tech industry growth and transformation through national programs and initiatives that drive and enhance the Singapore economy. There are three key roles at what we do, a business enabler, as a neutral platform and aggregator for the tech industry, we have various platforms that create opportunities for our members. A responsible voice, we run sessions with various government industry to provide feedback and give suggestions on how to help the industry. As for industry insights, we provide knowledge and intel on updates and news so that members will be more aware of the rapid changes and they could adapt it quickly. As to coordinate the needs of subsector within the ICT space, we have formed industry chapters and committees to support strategic and emerging sector. We have classified our chapter into tech verticals and non-tech horizontal. Under the tech verticals, we have AI high-performance computing, we have cloud and data chapter, cybersecurity, and for non-tech horizontal, we have digital transformation, Singapore enterprise, and smart nation chapter. Today, 
company can join SG Tech as a member, can choose which chapter they prefer to be involved in. Each chapter will plan activities and initiative to engage their chapter members and the industry. SG Tech also spin off committees that cater to emerging industry needs. For example, one, two, three jumpstart committee cater to young startup company. Gaming and education technology are gaining traction today. We have also formed these two committee to cater to the needs. Other committees are blockchain, data center, data protection, digital trust, government procurement, procurement SMA, SME Go Digital, Sustainability and Talent and Capability Committee. As new chapters and committees will be launched in response to the technology industrial, continued growth and needs. If you'd like to know more about Agitech, please do write to Agitech Secretary at membership at agitech.org.sg. Membership at agitech.org. I also like to thank our partner at Novum Technology, SBF, Singapore Business Federation, MATO, Manufacturing Alliance, Transforming Toward 4.0, and SMF, Singapore Manufacturing Federation, for supporting this webinar. I hope that you'll find this information helpful for your organization. I wish you a fruitful webinar ahead. Thank you. Over to you, Harish. Thank you, Dutch, for delivering the welcome address. Next, I would like to invite Mr. David Chan to take us through leveraging data for AI and ML in the age of IOB. Mr. Chan, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Harish. Thank you, Dutch. Uh, thanks for having us uh, being here uh, to talk about the internet of uh, behavior and make changes actually to the world. Um, let me start to sharing my screen. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm actually the head start and uh, just to give uh, <clears throat> a bit of an intro about Anubam, okay, of who we are. And then I will get into a bit of a tips about the internet of the behavior, uh, how is that being spin off, okay, from the internet of things and things like that. Then uh, of course, after that, then uh, our uh, head of engineering, Dayan, is going to be uh, continue uh, with you about uh, a bit more deep dive into uh, different topics about the machine learning uh, the, as a software 2.0 and as well as uh, on the good side and actually as uh, uh, the, 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 some of the risk that FES, uh, obviously that you need to take care in terms of the different practice and, the, uh, and as well as the governance of the uh, machine learning as well. Okay, let's start off with uh, a, just a very uh, short intro about Anovum. In fact, Anovum uh, is actually originated from uh, Switzerland as an organization. Uh, and we don't really have a, a very big footprint as of now, but we are very specialized in a certain areas, okay, particularly into uh, quite a bit of the advanced the technology uh, when it comes into the uh, programming actually in terms of using of the blockchain and as well as uh, quite specialized into the uh, AI and as well as an ML model, okay, in order to uh, try to make uh, the differences and as well as our uh, service offering to our customer. So as you can see that uh, we have done, uh, and as well as we are currently dealing with uh, quite a bit of the uh, government bodies um, and as well as the banks, so which is the banks actually are getting more and more into the AI model on how they will be able to leverage the data, how they will be able to train the machine learning and as well as the AI model in order to help them in terms of uh, the, uh, the daily operation and as well as how we'll be able to looking into the, the revenue uh, and as well as the things on, uh, on authentication and as well as the authorization part of it as well. Okay, so um, I understand that we have over 100 participants here. Um, so obviously, uh, we are trying to do some warm up here. 
It is because that we will try to understand about your uh, thinking or actually what your thought process about what is your what do you think of your organization as the current potential use case of the AIML in your organization. So uh, hope that you will be able to uh, have a thought and give some insights to us as well. Okay, that's pretty good. Hmm, okay. Uh, I don't know whether the customer experience is going to take over, but let's see. Okay, I can see actually the result is quite close. Uh, but when it comes into the in terms of the first choice or the first priority that people are thinking about is to do the efficiency improvement in terms of the task automation. Yes, so this is actually, uh, I think uh, from the everyone's from the top of their mind, it can be uh, going through a process of how the digitalization of a certain document or certain data will be able to streamline the, uh, the actually the operation side. So this basically I would say uh, uh, is going to be a quite useful uh, as a start of the AI or the ML in order to get the, uh, actually to get your feel and as well as to get your thought process going to see what other things it can be optimized. So number two is obviously on the uh, customer experience, right? Which is uh, quite true as well. So uh, whether it's on the credit card side or whether you want to now, particularly into the COVID-19 as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a norm, um, then we will be able to see people are more getting into the online and then uh, quite a lot of uh, actually, a majority of the activities are actually through the online as well. So we are able to see uh, such a uh, large population uh, has been, uh, in fact, to, to see such a, uh, uh, a target, uh, the online market uh, with the customer uh, in, in the market as well. All right. So I think I will stop here. All right. Okay, so having said that, um, before I actually start into this topic uh, as an internet of a behavior, in fact, that I think in uh, Gartner in 2020, between 2020 has been made some uh, forecasts and as well as a statistics. Um, in fact, that I think uh, whether we have in the COVID situation, their forecast is actually will be able to see that there will be 40% 40% of the world's population individually activities will be digital tracked to influence their behavior. Okay, what does that mean? So that means, in, what is that being implied? That will be close to about 3 billion people, 3 billion amount of the people will be impacted or they will be digital tracked, okay, on a daily basis. Okay, with the different kinds of the data and as well as of the device that is surrounding you. Okay, now with this kind of well, what we call as unlinked data, how you will be able to make sense out of those, okay, which is basically the topic here as of today. Uh, um, now, reflect into that statistics. Basically, if it comes into uh, the 2023, around that period of time, then they are talking about there will be close to about 127 new devices will be connected into the internet on every second. Okay, so we will be able to see what, uh, how large or how large of the volume of the data, then they it will be able to basically transmit or transfer between the, from one point into the other. Right, so this is why I think that the internet world and we all know that this is going to be a lot of opportunities. But at the same time, this is also that will be imposed quite a bit of the 
risk and as well as uh, what we call as a uh, uh, ethics uh, uh, consideration okay among the sharing of the data as well okay so moving forward so as we all can see that uh, by taking from the poll data right with uh, all different kinds of a device so everybody usually will have uh, more than one handphone even though myself even though my wife also have uh, two handphones usually one on the business and the one actually on the personal and then surrounding us okay there's a lot of data whether you are doing your taxi booking uh, whether you are doing your shopping whether you are doing any types of it uh, in fact that um, we, uh, we we just have done a, a bit of the research and as well as a study uh, in fact that we are talking about a concept of we don't need to do any more of the survey form okay to do any of the online survey to our customer okay so for example if there is a a, a, a a customer is actually to book or to get into a taxi from point a to point b in fact that they will know okay the taxi company will be able to know their experience even though by tracking about the speed of the driver how the driver behave and as well as the route that has been taken and then they will be able to predict and they will be able to forecast okay what kind of the set uh, uh, the, the sentiment about of this customer as well okay so this is all about the, the, the learning of the behavior and that's based on a certain event or certain incidents that happens right so this is why the internet of behavior is to make use of this data that is coming from the, the internet of things okay and then we'll translate or what we call and transform this from data information into knowledge and even wisdom right so this is all about in terms of how we will be able to make use of this data so human beings definitely will not be able to analyze and as well as to to understand all this data. Okay, this is why the AI and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning model is actually coming in. Okay, so there's always be a few areas. Obviously, uh, the, the uh, customer data and as well as the automation when it actually landed into your, for example, the customer data will be landed into your database. This is where that you will be able to make use of this data to understand their buying pattern uh what actually the habit uh what is actually what they like uh, uh whether they have been checked out uh in uh, from your shopping cart all this will be definitely is something that you can think of in terms of the increase of the revenue right so on the right hand side you will be able to see there's a lot of potential business outcome out of that okay solving problems okay increase of the sales uh as i say replace of the multiple customer survey um, uh, also the buying uh, habit okay from all different platforms okay how the customer is actually uh, the, the, the the vendors will be able to make use of this data in order to do the upsell and as well as a cross sell then of course nevertheless based on this data the machine learning model eventually will be able to help in terms of doing the defense of uh, different kinds of the uh, cyber hacking okay that talking about uh, the authentic uh, authentication of a certain user or even though authentication of the uh, uh, so-called different IoT device before it actually getting into your into your territory authorization also right credit card is always using this machine learning model in order to do the authentication based on what they learn from you okay so this all is about the whole around you about the data and as well as to make use of the data in order to 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 do the certain business outcome and as well as the, the defense in terms of the authentication and also the uh, authorization okay of the uh, of the defense uh, before it actually hits uh, into uh, into your territory okay so uh, understand the timing is uh, getting shorter um, one thing obviously uh, on one side we all know that the, the data is very essential okay the, at the same time don't forget about uh, a lot of us, uh, a story about the data breaches uh, from uh, different organization in fact they make a, a statistics one single incident of breach usually will uh, basically will impact an organization from a business angle 
uh, will be in a cumulative value of more than uh, 3.2 to 3.5 million dollars. All right. So this is another angle of whether the machine learning will be able to help in order to do this cyber defense as well. So later on, uh, uh, Dian is going to deep dive a little bit into that. All right. So uh, up to this point, I think uh, uh, the basically we can do another poll as well. All right. So the question here is, what is the current potential use case of the AI ML in your organization? Okay, whether it's still talking about the customer experience, efficiency improvement, and as well as the security posture. Yeah. So I beg your pardon. So I think the question is uh, I'm making a little bit change here. Okay, is that is about what is the maturity stage of your organization when it comes into the analytics or the AI or ML? Yeah, I beg your pardon. <clears throat> So it looks like we have uh, quite a bit of the uh, interesting vote here. Okay. Okay, let's see the result. Okay, looks like the result is quite obvious. Quite a lot of uh, you are thinking about to explore to make use of the AI model in your production. Okay, so I will be able to see, obviously, I, I probably, I can see a lot of manufacturing, or even though it can be on the logistics side of the organization, maybe attending this event, okay, which is good. Okay, um, yes, I think into the production, eventually it will make the, you, the AI will, will, if we make effective of the AI, it will be quite helpful in terms of the, uh, the, the industry uh, throughput and as well as the productivity, uh, whether you are using the robotic as well. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. Ah, okay, so since I, unfortunately, I would not know too much about your background, but uh, just to give you some example in terms of the, uh, the uh, machine learning usage uh, case study, Okay, when it comes into the different industry, uh, insurance, uh, a lot of them are talking about from the, uh, re, uh, the repair cost. A lot of them are talking about the optimization in terms of the internal process. Uh, logistic, of course, the fleet management, the uh, capacity planning, uh, all these are actually one part of it. Uh, on the healthcare, of course, a lot of them are talking about the uh, uh, telemedicine or even though on the AI in terms of the different kinds of uh, uh, diagnostic, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, these are just to give you some uh, machine learning example, okay, from the different industry. I uh, hope that that will be able to help. All right, so without any further delay, um, I think I will just pass it back into Harish, right? So thanks very much. Thank you, David, for delivering your sharing. Next, I'd like to invite Mr. Dayan Dukarik to take us through on how to identify, assess, and mitigate risks impacting ML developments. Over to you, Dayan. Thank you, Arish. And let me share my screen. Okay, so before uh, David was sharing about the big impact IOB can have on us and the society. And I would like to talk about what kind of risk this can bring and what we can do about these risks. 
Um, and in particular, I will talk about some attacks on machine learning systems maybe you're not aware of. So the top two boxes you can look at, you probably know or have heard of. So you use machine learning to attack systems. For example, there are ways to create automatic phishing emails. There are vulnerability discovery and exploitation machine learning models in place. And there are also deep fakes and realistic fake news. Maybe you have also seen that where, yeah, there is a machine learning created face that looks like a real person and you can basically not distinguish this from a, from a real person. But on the other hand, we also use machine learning to defend our software systems, for example, spam filter. There are network intrusion detection and prevention systems, and we also use it to secure our authentication. But today I will talk about attacks on machine learning systems itself. And in particular, I will talk about three specific attacks. They're called adversarial input attack, data poisoning attack, and model privacy attacks. I will also give you some examples so that you get an understanding of what kind of attacks there are around and uh, yeah, that you are aware of them and can protect against them. And this whole area is called adversarial machine learning and it's basically called the field of research, which is about how learning algorithms can be compromised. So adversarial machine learning has gained quite some traction in the recent years only. Uh, in a report by Microsoft in 2021, they interviewed 28 different organizations and they asked them, one of the questions they asked them, do, they, do you secure your machine learning systems? And only three of them uh, said yes, 22 said no. So there really seems to be not so much awareness that systems can actually be attacked. And also when they did uh, interviews with the different people at these organizations, they found out that Traditional attacks, the people are aware of that. These are known unknowns. They know about these attacks, but they don't know how it exactly happens or when it happens. But most of these people were not aware that actually there are attacks on machine learning models itself. Basically, these are unknown unknowns. They're not aware that such uh, attacks exist. But after this presentation, you will know about them and you will be able to take measures. And it's not something that only small companies uh, are affected. Also Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Tesla, they all have been actually been attacked by such adversarial machine learning attacks. And you can also see in recent years, there's a lot of research that has been done on this adversarial machine learning. Um, started very slowly 2014, but now last year, there were more than 1,500 research papers published. So these are papers about the attacks, but of course also against defenses against these attacks. So it's really an arms race at the moment going on, which shows attacks and defenses against these attacks. So I would like to now very, very quickly on a high level uh, say what is a typical machine learning deployment scenario so that everybody is on the same page and will understand what I talk about afterwards. So in a machine learning, Typically, you have two phases. You have a first phase, a training phase, where you train your machine learning model. And then afterwards, you have a trained model. You use training data and the framework code to train this model. And afterwards, once this model is trained, you deploy it to production. And for example, you make it open via an API, and then people can send some input and you make a prediction. So I think this is an example, let's say, you want to have an algorithm that can distinguish between dogs and cats. So this is your training data. This means you have to collect a lot of data. Maybe you have your own data or you collect it on the internet. So this is the first step. Then you use this data with a specific machine learning algorithm. This is the framework code. This is typically a neural network uh, for uh, image recognition. Then you train this and then you have a trained model and then you can uh, deploy this model and then you can put in a new picture of a different cat, which is not been used in the training data. And then the algorithm will say, yeah, I'm 99% confident that this is a cat and 1% confident that it's a dog. So first it's important to see that actually it's not typically not 100% confidence, right? For, for a human being, it's obvious this is a cat, but for machine learning, there's still, uh, there's often an uncertainty there and typically the algorithm will tell you how confident the algorithm is in a certain output. 
So this is just a model I will use afterwards so that everybody's aware it's typically a training phase where we use a lot of data to train our model and then we deploy the model and then we can use this model to make predictions, for example, here to distinguish between cats and dogs. But why I said before that there are attacks specifically on machine learning models. And the reason is, uh, the question is why this is the case, right? And so in this slide, I would like to give you some intuition why machine learning is different, machine learning software is different from the traditional software and why there are attacks on machine learning models which don't exist at the moment on the classical software. So that's why you can call machine learning software 2.0. So I try to explain here why this is like that. So now on the left hand side, you see the traditional secure development lifecycle, right? This is very established. There are many best practices, this documented. There is a lot of literature about that, a lot of courses and so on. So there is best practices established and the industry and the companies know about that and they apply that. So for example, in many companies that have performing, that do perform static analysis um, of their code, before they deploy it, they have some tools. I don't know, SonarQ, for example, that does some analysis of the code and then see um, is everything fine with the code and if not, uh, fix it. So there is some tools available for that. But also we can do performance, uh, we perform a threat modeling. What are all the possible threats that are around that uh, our code or our system can be attacked? So this is all documented and people, when they try to defend their system, they look at this stuff and, and find good countermeasures to make sure the system is secured. So this is how it traditionally works. But now the question is, what is the, the key challenge here with our machine learning models? So you can imagine the, the big ball you can see here is the space of all possible software programs we can write. It's a huge space, there are so many different softwares that are possible. But in the end, the software we write is done by a human being, writes a piece of code, and typically there is an if then else, some for loop, as you know, many of you know this very, very simple code that uh, shows in the end uh, what the program should do. But it's very explicit. So this is software 1.0. It's very explicitly written down by some programmer what the software should do. So it's uh, only a very small uh, subspace of this whole space of possible programs. And typically, the complexity is also not so big. So that's why it's more towards the center. Towards the outside, it's more complex programs. Uh, because yeah, the human being, we, it's too, we cannot make too complex things, even though, of course, our software we write, we think it's very complex. But actually, against machine learning models, it's not complex at all. And what is the difference now to machine learning model? There, you have a lot of data. You start with data. Then you have an algorithm, let's say a neural network. And then you let your algorithm run on this data. This is an optimization algorithm, which you can see here in the blue, goes uh, through all these blue possible programs and tries to find the best possible program so that it can predict, for example, the cat with very high probability. So this is an optimization. This can take hours, days, or even weeks. So for very, very complex uh, machine learning models, if you train a neural network, which has millions and billions of parameters, it can take weeks to program and can cost millions of dollars. And typically, the output of this optimization is just a bunch of numbers. So millions of parameters, as you can see now on the, on the right hand side, this, that's why I call it software 2.0. Typically, it's just a matrix multiplication with a vector. So this is the uh, output of your algorithm is a huge matrix. And this you use afterwards to make a prediction to say, is it a cat or is it a dog? But if you look at this huge matrix of numbers, you have no idea what this is doing in detail, right? It's just numbers and you cannot read it as a piece of code. So that's the really big difference between software 1.0, which we explicitly write, and software 2.0, which we don't explicitly write, but an algorithm, a neural network, for example, will find the software itself. And in the end, the outcome is just a huge bunch of, a huge bunch of numbers which will predict, for example, cat or dog. And this means like the malicious behavior and the vulnerabilities are deeply embedded in these millions of parameters. And the current security tools cannot find out, is this now a malicious program or is this program doing what it should do? There are just no such tools available at the moment. So like this static analysis, 
not possible. And also the threat modeling, there are many more different threats available now than in the classical setting. So that's uh, the big difference here is that you cannot use your classical tools anymore to analyze it because it's not written code anymore. It's huge matrices of numbers. Um, yeah. And this leads to a big gap to the traditional uh, secure development life cycle. I will not go into all the details, but there are many, many gaps now if you develop uh, machine learning models. There are gaps in the development stage, there are gaps in the deployment stage, or there are gaps also when the ML system is attacked. That's just one I mentioned, right? There is no tool available now that can do the static analysis of the deployed machine learning model to say, yes, this is secure, this machine learning model, or no, this is not secure. So I hope you get some rough idea or intuition what, why machine learning is different from the traditional way we write software. Because we don't write it explicitly, an algorithm will discover the software for us, it'll optimize it. Okay, let's go to the question number three. Um, the last one for today, what are the current barriers your organizations currently face with AI and machine learning? So it's a shortage of machine learning talents, budget limitations, low data readiness, uncertainty around its usefulness or any security concerns you have. Answers come in. So at the moment, it looks like that the shortage of machine learning talents is at the top, closely followed by budget limitations, probably related to each other. If you have more money, you can higher better talents, but also the low data readiness is quite high. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I think that's okay. We have now 54 answers and we have a shortage of machine learning talents with 61% uh, at the top, followed by 57% with uh, budget limitations and 41% with low data readiness. Okay, thank you very much uh, for joining this poll. Okay. So now I will talk about uh, three common attacks against machine learning systems. So the, it's called data poisoning, adversarial inputs, and model privacy attacks. So let's start with the data poisoning. The idea here is that we feed bad adversarial training data into your machine learning model to make it wrong predictions, right? Like that we put in bad pictures, adversarial pictures, for example, of dogs and cats, so that in the end, the model makes wrong predictions. So I think the easiest is make, to make some examples here. The first one is about the, the Twitter chat box bot by Microsoft. It was called Thai. And they published this uh, bot. And this is a machine learning bot, which uh, automatically creates Twitter messages. But it uh, learns online. So depending on the interaction with, the, with users, it learns and updates its Twitter tweets. And then there were some people who basically poisoned this uh, Twitter bot by doing interactions or writing stuff that in the end poisoned it and made this Twitter bot say things you don't want your Twitter bot say if you are Microsoft. I know, for example, uh, Bush did 9-11 and Hitler would have done a better job. So, right, you don't want that. Uh, this has a very bad impact on your reputation if uh, your bot is saying such things. So this was a, a poisoning attack. Another poisoning attack was against the Gmail spam filter. Not in, in Gmail, you can say if, a, if an email has been classified as spy, you, uh, a spam, you can click on it and say, no, no, this is no spam. And what some attackers did, they wrote some scripts that automatically um, un, uh, unspammed many emails they had, right? And this, because this will then be used by the machine learning model of Google to update their algorithm because, ah, oh, I misclassified something as spam. So I should not do that anymore. So you can see there, there are some attempts to skew the machine learning model by some attackers. So to make sure that the, the Gmail 
the spam filter does some wrong filtering so that in the end spams actually landed in the inbox of people because these people were successfully could skew the machine learning model by this data poisoning. So you can see these uh, even Microsoft and Google are not safe from such kind of attacks. Then I would like to talk about adversarial inputs. Here the attack idea, attack idea is to create artificial input, it can be text, image, sound, and so on, that gets wrongly classified by a machine learning model. But if you look at this input, it looks to you completely uh, reasonable. So for example, they manipulate the picture of a cat just a little bit. You, for you, it's still a cat, but the algorithm will say 99% it's a dog. So, and there are methods that you can create such adversarial inputs. So let me make some examples. Uh, first here on text, this is a text um, against the fake news filter. So here's an example, this is from a research paper. The original text is perfect performance by the actor. And the algorithm uh, rates this is a positive statement, 99%, which is obvious, right? It's well done by the algorithm. Uh, it rates it as positive. But then they did some... Uh, optimization to find out to create an input which is still positive for a human being right spotless performance by an actor this is a positive review of the actor it's nothing negative but the algorithm will say 100 percent negative so they could find a weakness in this uh, machine learning model which they can use afterwards to bring down uh, the ratings for example by just it looks very natural spotless performance should be something positive but the algorithm says no no 100% negative. Then also on uh, voice recognition systems like Alexa, Siri, and so on, that you can change the sound a little bit. You almost don't hear it. So you can go to the link that I, I put under this box, which you can actually see some examples. And for example, here you see on the left-hand side, um, the voice says, Specifically, the union said it was proposing the purchase, to purchase all of the assets of the United Airlines, including plane gate facilities. Very, nothing suspicious in this text. And what the researchers did, they just changed this a little bit. If you listen to it, you hear some background noise, but it's still that this text you hear. But what Alexa hears is something completely different. Alexa hears deactivate security camera and unlock front door completely different and you don't hear it but Alexa hears this so they could manipulate the sound just a little bit that you don't hear the difference much but Alexa hears something completely different this can also have security implications of course so you can go to this page to listen to these examples and the last one is an example for a text against the uh, image recognition system in particular here it's about uh, traffic sign identification so what these researchers did, they took, um, let's say here, a stop sign and just manipulated the stop sign a little bit. For example, they put some uh, camouflage graffiti on it or some art, some patches on it. For you as a human being, it still looks like a stop sign. Obviously, right? This is stop, nothing else. But what does the machine learning algorithm say? For example, for the, the, from the left side, the second from the right side, 100% it's 45 speed limit. So if you are sitting in a Tesla driving and the Tesla reads the stop sign as 45 speed limit, uh, it's very dangerous, obviously. So by just doing these small patches, so this is a real world attack, you can just go there and attach these spots on the stop sign and then the car can identify this as 45 uh, miles per hour. So this has been shown, this attack, that this is possible. And as a human being, you don't see much difference here. So there's also really serious uh, implications on the security side here. Then I would like to talk about the last attack, about the model privacy attacks. And here it's about obtaining sensitive or proprietary information about the machine learning model uh, by just querying the public uh, machine learning API, for example. So one example is that, let's say you have trained your machine learning model, you have used a lot of data only you have, and you're very proud of your machine learning model. And now you make it public as an API, but just that the people can query it and you want to sell 
want to sell this, right? Every time the people use your API, they have to pay uh, some Singapore dollar for it. And yeah, you think my, I only open up the API, nobody can steal my machine learning model. This is not true. So by just making queries to the API, people will be able to reverse engineer your machine learning model to create a machine learning, mo machine learning model of similar performance, even though they don't have your data to train it. And this attack has been done, for example, to imitate Google Translate. Google Translate is doing a very good job. And they did an attack to query the machine learning model of Google Translate. And in the end, they could create the machine learning model that could also translate almost as good as Google Translate could do. And they didn't have to put in all the, the same research as the Google had to do. So be careful with making your proprietary machine learning model public. There it's possible to reverse engineer it. Additionally, attackers can also infer information about the training data. So you maybe think, I uh, use only in the training, why are they able to get any information? But actually, it's possible to get information out of it. So for example, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see some two faces. And uh, what they did, these researchers, is they trained a machine learning model with different faces. So they use, for example, the face on the right-hand side they used to train. And afterwards, they reconstructed the face on the left-hand side just by querying the machine learning model. So they could find out what data has been used, not perfectly, but it's a quite good approximation. They could use, see which facial, which faces have been used to train these machine learning models. But this can also be used to get some other sensitive information. For example, if you, have, if you train your, your hospital and you train a machine learning model to predict cancer, for example, then you use sensitive information of your patients. And then if you make this public, it can be possible that people can reverse engineer uh, that and get information out about your patients. For example, if some certain patient had cancer or not. So we also have to be very careful here uh, with that. Okay, then maybe very quickly to recommended practices and about uh, machine learning governance. So the first step is that you have to identify what are the potential threats to the system, right? I hope my presentation now gives you some idea of what kind of th threats there are around. This was not a complete uh, picture. There's more uh, attacks around. And then you have to think about, does anyone have an incentive to actually make your system misbehave? And if there is a big incentive for somebody to do it, then better take measures. But if there is actually no, no danger there, then maybe not necessary to take any measures. Then you also, of course, have to assess the likelihood. How likely is it that um, something happens? And what is the severity of the impact uh, if something happens? Then it's important to build a threat model to understand all these possible attack vectors. And once you understand these threats that are around, you can develop an approach to combat these threats. Um, so there are tools available that help you to test the performance of your system to really, for example, to test if it's, can it be attacked with adversarial input? There are tools that help you to detect that, how robust your machine learning model is. Also useful can be to create an internal red team. So this is basically an internal hacking team that tries to attack your machine learning models to find out weaknesses so you can fix them. And another way to do it is also to host both bounty programs that third parties try to, uh, uh, yeah, adversarially test your systems with data poisoning or adversarial inputs or try to get inf sensitive information out of your machine learning models. I think very important because it's still a very active field of research, very kind of new only since like two, three years, very active and a lot of research has been published. It's important to stay up to date and know the latest research advances it's because maybe I showed you these attacks today, but tomorrow a new attack can be here and which can be even more serious against your machine learning models. So it's important to be prepared also for new attack vectors. And I think also a proper and solid machine learning AI governance framework will help you to manage these risks related to deploying your machine learning models. You can help, this can help your organization to learn, to govern and monitor and also make sure uh, your AI adoption. So they did a survey here from the Wharton School um, for financial institutions. And there you can see they still kind 
some lack of maturity in, in, in machine learning governance, but they already started doing it. So it's not that nothing has been done. So it's already, uh, there are policies and standards for machine learning there, let's say for 50% of these uh, banks, for example. So this is the first step, I think, to also think about how to set up a proper machine learning governance. Okay, that what was it from my side. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Daniel, uh, for the insightful sharing. We shall now proceed to the panel discussion. May I request David and Dayan to join us for the panel discussion. Also to moderate the session, we are pleased to have uh, Mr. Kenzo, Executive Committee Member of Cybersecurity Chapter, SG Tech. Uh, now is the time for you to raise any burning questions you may have to our panelists. Uh, do drop your questions in the Q&A tab for us to have an engaging and insightful discussion ahead. Over to you, panelists. Thank you, Harish. Yes, uh, thank you for having me to uh, moderate this uh, panel. Uh, I think AI ML has been a large and common topic today. And then today, I think, coupled with the uh, gaps that uh, Dayan mentioned, uh, I think it's an eye opener. It is a big dimension that uh, I believe uh, would have a lot of questions coming along. Uh, so far, I don't see any question uh, yet coming in. Uh, however, personally, I have some um, very curious question. Maybe for a start, because uh, David mentioned a lot uh, focusing on the use case and the maturity side. And I know there was a slide just now uh, with like six example domains. Um, maybe, David, would you like to share um, how uh, can people usually apply ML into specific domain, maybe just uh, some example that you have uh, uh, experienced yeah, for the benefit of the audience. Uh, right, right. Thanks, Ken. Uh, this is actually a pretty good question, right? So, uh, of course, when it comes into the organization in Singapore, right? In fact, quite a lot of us, or I would say the organization, because we all know that uh, the SME market and as well as the number of the small and medium organization in Singapore are quite large, right? But it can be uh, quite a lot of them is actually in the uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, even though uh, some of them are, can be in a certain financial services sector, okay? And as well as the logistic as well. So from there, we will be able to see uh, some of the use case here, right? In terms of when it comes into financial services, definitely we'll talk about uh, the uh, customer churn, uh, even though into the retail and as well as uh, uh, quite a lot of the uh, retail industry. So the customer behavior experience and as well as that, that is quite important. So that is on one side to see how this uh, will be able to help in terms of the sales uh, increase. Uh, of course, on the logistics side, how AI or ML definitely will be able to help very quickly is about all, all this uh, logistic arrangement and as well as the capacity planning make a good example of uh, then we have been talking to quite a lot of uh, logistic company I'm talking about it's not a very large one right the issues is usually is uh, they don't really have a very good capacity planning okay I don't want to make an organization even though a, a pretty large organization in Singapore uh, they have this kind of an issue on I have a truckload right then how I will be able to maximize my so-called my, my fuel consumption in order to reach into all different points, right? So all this planning, the, the route planning, how the consumption works, in, take into the order of the, uh, 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 this, this uh, calculation, this is usually AI ML definitely will help, all right? Uh, usually a lot of organization will start from there, okay? Because for the SME, another issue with that is uh, in order to have the M, uh, ML or AI works in that model, most of the time you will need to have quite a bit of the uh, historic data. Okay, the more the data you have, the more data you will be able to train, the more data you will be able to sanitize, right? So this is also a, being a one part of that. This uh, uh, a lot of organization in the SME will be lacking, okay? But we all know that the uh, ML AI is the way to go. Okay, just a matter of how we'll be able to start off with that journey. Okay, then there will be a learning period for a human and as well as a machine as well. 
All right. Thank you, David. Yes, thank you for the insightful sharing. Now, the question is uh, a question for uh, Dian. I think uh, it's naturally your sharing actually set my heart pounding very fast because it's like for all of us to marching into the world of uh, metrics and Terminator. Um, maybe, maybe you can share with us with this new dimension of gaps that we can see today. Uh, so how, how do we share with us? How do we actually protect the ML platform in, in that sense? Uh, at the end, I think you are muted. Yeah. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, so I think important is first, you have to ask yourself about, do you need to make the machine learning model you develop, do you need to make it public or not? Because this makes already a huge difference. If you have to make it public, then this makes it vulnerable to these adversarial inputs and model privacy attacks. So I would recommend if it's not really necessary and your business model does not really depend on it to make it public, I would recommend just authenticate an authorized user to access your machine learning model. So this is the first step, just really think about, is it really necessary? And if only if it's really necessary, then you can make it public. But if you make it public, then you have to be aware of these uh, attacks I, I mentioned here. Um, for example, for the adversarial inputs, what you can do about that to protect against these attacks, one way is to train your model on adversarial inputs yourself. So you create yourself input, adversarial input, and then train your model on that to make it more robust. So this has been shown to work quite well. It's not a perfect solution because if somebody else comes and does create the adversarial inputs in a different way, your model will not be safe again, but you can try to use all the existing attacks that exist and try to create this kind of inputs. There are also tools available for that. You don't have to do it yourself. There are tools to create these inputs and then you can train your model. It will take some more time, of course, and then it should be more robust against manipulation. So this is, is I think, a good step to go. Um, then for the model privacy attacks, um, one way you can do it, there is about, it's called differential privacy, and there is also a framework called Pate, which helps you to make sure that people cannot get information about uh, the training data out of your model. And what this typically is doing, it adds some noise uh, to your output and does some other complicated things actually, and they also take some more time to train, but in the end, it makes it very difficult for an attacker to get some information out of it. There is some drawback here. Typically, the more private your model is, the less accurate it is. So there's kind of a trade-off. So if you want to have very good privacy, maybe or it will be a little bit less accurate afterwards. So the, correct, the forecast will be a little bit less accurate. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Dian. I believe the topic is very big. So audience, please feel free to contact uh, Dian subsequent to this session. Uh, protection is never easy. Um, now I see that there are two questions coming in. Ah, that's very good. Uh, they are very pertinent to uh, and very practical. I think the first one is with regard to the protection of AIML in the context of NGO, right? Non-profit uh, volunteer-based organization. So probably our channel is to uh, David. Uh, would you like to take that question? Ah, okay. So um, the question, let me see. Uh, is it yes. about... Uh, what is the impact and the benefits actually AIML would uh, bring forth yeah, to non-profit volunteer-based organization? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, I mean, uh, it's also matter about what kind of a use case, right, uh, that people will be able to think of. Um, of course, I will not get into the gauge of to understand uh, uh, which area of the NGO organization to, that you are dealing with. But usually when I see in uh, my, when I, uh, uh, in the days and when I talking about uh, uh, dealing with uh, NCSS and those organizations, uh, quite a lot of them are talking about in terms of the, the management of the uh, voluntary, okay, which uh, until now I think is still being a big issue, right? One is about the digital adoption, okay, uh, uh, using uh, uh, the handset and whatsoever, but at the same time, because a lot of those volunteer is, uh, can be having a, it can be, uh, do not really have a full-time job or they will help on the uh, 
uh, part-time basis. A lot of them regarding those kind of a rostering and as well as their interests. Uh, all this, uh, we can think about how we'll be able to use this uh, uh, machine learning. It will be able to help them in terms of uh, uh, getting their pro proper planning going and as well as the certain alert can be able to trigger, right? And we'll be able to uh, have this kind of alert to, uh, in, in terms of to help on the uh, scheduling and uh, also to alert on if there's any of the so-called exception things to happen, right? Uh, that happens into the luxury home as well that we've been seeing, okay? Uh, on how we'll be able to monitor on the certain exception or the incident to happen, even though uh, uh, if you are making a too close to the side of the bed and all these will be able to use the ML in order to detect and then uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, send the, the immediate alert actually to the people in charge or what they call as the, the people that is taking care of the flow as well. So all these uh, can be uh, some, some type of the uh, use case uh, for some of the NTO organization. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the very pertinent uh, answer. I reckon that with more specific use cases within the NGO, you will be able to answer better. So, uh, Nisha, I hope this answers the question. And uh, please feel free to contact David subsequent in the session as well. Uh, yes, we have another question from Gary. And I think he's uh, talking about uh, every, every day's use of uh, AI and ML. And uh, what, wow, this is interesting. What are the situations that uh, ML would not be suitable for the organization. Yeah, so I'm not too sure whether David or Dian would like to take, take up this uh, question. Maybe I reckon it's the use case base, right? So it's more towards uh, David. Yeah, if you don't mind. Ah, <laughs> organization cannot use a ML. Um, cannot find. <laughs> Cannot seems to be cannot find them to be very honest, uh, because uh, as I mentioned, the data is getting more and more. Okay, we all know that this is actually the fact. So and uh, any in terms of the flop detection, even those surrounding with the customer, as I mentioned, anything surrounding with uh, your anything that will be even though to impact your behavior or and as well as your experience, actually, uh, AI ML now is actually surrounding us already. Okay, whether you know it or you don't know it. Huh? Uh, so I, I, unfortunately, I haven't seen any uh, so-called ML case. Uh, so far hasn't really been uh, uh, so-called as a, uh, as, a, as a large rejection on it. But uh, at the same time, uh, the importance of it is, as I mentioned, it, the, the point of the ML definitely will have uh, some role to play. But in order to support the ML to function and to execute well, right? As I mentioned earlier uh, during the session, uh, the practice and as well as the governance is something that is very important. And as well as whether you will have used data or enough data in order to feed the ML so that this model will be able to get in more and more effective, more efficient, and as well as more well-trained in order to help you. Okay, so I think that is the point and how I see that it will impact whether a ML model or ML example will be suitable for your industry or suitable for your, uh, 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 for your case as well, right? So this is why it is related into uh, our offering uh, when it comes into uh, the certain data maturity assessment and as well as to share the certain use case, whether it's something that you can think of and then we'll think about whether uh, such a use case will be applicable to you. And this is, I think, something that we can offer, okay, uh, on uh, today's audience in order to uh, continue this conversation and hope that we will be able to find a particular use case that you will be able to uh, fit to, to basically to fit your need. Sure. I reckon that is a very large uh, subject. Ah. And uh, now I also understand that all of us are standing between the lunch and the audience. <laughs> so <laughs> about time to uh, wrap this up. Uh, so as usual practice in uh, plenaries, uh, I reckon you'll be useful for um, the audience. 
if uh, would you uh, speakers like to share uh, just maybe a short elevator statement of uh, the takeaway of this? Yeah, yeah. So uh, thank, thanks again. In fact, I think I, I just uh, started and entered my uh, elevator pitch already. <laughs> but uh, obviously, I think uh, uh, this has been the pressure that uh, to having us here today, okay, and uh, to gain uh, the, the insight about this section. So we all mentioned about data is the new power of today's, okay, and as well as the future, right? In order to be able to work around all this kind of a seas of data, we're talking about whether it's terabyte and all these, right? Now, the use the machine to help obviously is something is the trend to go, right? Uh, how to start, where to start, whether you have a case, right? Uh, and as well as how the governance and the practice is going to be worked out. I think uh, let's have the further discussion as well as, as well as a deep discussion of that. So as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, our organization is more than willing to offer uh, this assessment and as well as a discussion on a certain use case with you based on the industry. Uh, that probably the next step that is more than welcome to uh, to have uh, to have you to uh, contact us for the further discussion. Sure, thank you very much, David. Uh, Ian, elevator takeaway. Yeah. Also, just very quickly. So, there is a huge potential in machine learning, and actually, uh, there is no industry that will not profit from machine learning. So that's why the question, like, there is no answer to this question. I think that every industry can, can profit from it. And it will also help the people to do more interesting jobs, actually. I think it also will help the, all the boring stuff can be done by machine learning and the people can work on creative, challenging works and really create, create a lot of value. But we have to be considerate and keep in mind that when we do that, we have to take it, do it in a way that is uh, robust, is secure. We have the safety in place because otherwise it can have very negative impact, which can really slow down the whole AI adoption. Because if people get afraid of the AI systems and don't want to use it anymore, this will have a very uh, negative impact. So we have to make sure that we find the right balance by introducing new things, but also making sure that what we do is secure. Sure. Thank you very much, Dian. Yes, we can see the direction of human civilization going forward with regard to AI ML as well with these considerations. Yes, we are aware, we are aware that there are two more uh, questions, but unfortunately we don't have enough time to uh, address them. Uh, one from Henry and another one from uh, Anonymous. Uh, so I think uh, uh, feel free to, to drop uh, David or Dian an, an email on further questions. All right. So uh, in the interest of time, I would hand over the session back to Harris. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken, David, and Dayan for the insightful sharing. Uh, I believe there are many takeaways for our attendees um, this morning. Uh, also, please do refer to the screen uh, for the email addresses of our speakers. You may reach out to our speakers via email for the complimentary data maturity assessment. So you would be able to see uh, David and Dayan's um, email addresses over here. Also, we would appreciate if you could scan the QR code shown on the screen to give us your feedback for today's session. For those of you who have participated in the polls, we'll be sharing your contact details with Adnovum as you have given us consent for Adnovum to reach out to you for the, after this webinar. Thank you once again for joining us today, and we hope to see you at our next event. Stay safe and have a nice day ahead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.